I request Dr. Sujata Mukhopadhyay for fast prayer proceeding. Sujata, uh, thank. Thank you, Shonali Di. Thank you, Shonali Di. I hope Welcome. I'm audible. Welcome. Uh, okay. Welcome. Once again, a very good evening to you all. Impact of on COVID behalf of Hiralal Masumda Memorial Economy, College, organized jointly on. by IQAC, Department of Economics, and Department of Commerce. According to, to the IMF, the global economy is expected to shrink by over 3% in 2020, the steepest slowdown since the Great Depression of 1930s. Amidst this corona pandemic, may Many countries have resorted to lockdown in shutting down business and seizing almost all it now as some countries lift restrictions and gradually restart their economies. Here is a look at how the pandemic has affected us. We have today with us three very eminent speakers to render the their value economics and the dean. Faculty we Council welcome. of PG Studies Dr. in Professor Arts, Sanchi Commerce Kukhi. and Law, North Bengal University. We also have with us Dr. Professor Shoibal Kaur. He is the Honorary Di Director, ICSSR ERC and Professor of Economics. We are also delighted to have Dr. Pranam Dhar with us. He is the Associate Professor, Department of Commerce and Management, West Bengal State we University. We also express our sincere thanks to Dr. Shoma Ghosh, Principal and Secretary, Hiralal Mazumdar Memorial College for Women, for her untiring efforts in organizing quality webinars, our IQAC coordinator, Dr. Rupa Sen, our bursar, Dr. Lipika Malik, Secretary Teachers Council, Dr. Pradeep Das, Seminar Subcommittee Convener, Sri Pradeep Mukherjee, Joint Convener, Dr. Shonali Mukherjee and Pritam Dhara. Last but not the least, technical support throughout this webinar has been given by Ms. Pooja Das and Ms. Atre Bhattacharya. Now may I request our Principal Madam to please take over from here. Thank you, Shujata. Hope I am audible enough. Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay, fine. Uh, <clears throat> let me uh, begin with my uh, enormous sense of gratitude and thanks to Professor Shanchari Rai Mukherjee. I'm not going into details of introducing anybody because today we have the speakers who actually uh, do not need any introduction. I welcome Dr. Professor Shoibal Kaur, as well as I welcome Dr. Pranam Dhar. Actually, Dr. Pranam Dhar, uh, to, be, uh, to, to be very precise, is more from our college than from some external university. And West Bengal State University is our affiliating university. So we take Dr. Pranam Dhar our esteemed <coughs> host than an honored guest. As we know that COVID-19 pandemic is surely one of the biggest crises that this decade is facing. It not only challenged our healthcare providers, but it also brought a plateau full of challenges for our economists, decision makers and program implementers. Due to increasing unemployment and an uncertainty caused by the pandemic, the income of people and rate of consumption are both in a verge of downfall. Government of <coughs> in India uh, is now, uh, has now started receiving lesser non-tax revi uh, revenues which is going to affect our development also. As a result, indirect taxes are increasing, pointing its finger towards inflation in the prices of essential and non-essential commodities. 
Consequently, the gap between the line of equality is getting higher. Recently, the United Nations University released a report titled Estimates of the Impact of COVID-19 on Global Poverty. According to this report, India has an estimated 812 million poor people, which could increase to 915 million due to the impact of COVID pandemic. As per ILO, Around 400 million workers from India's informal sector are likely to be pushed deeper into the poverty. Government of India and our uh, uh, state government both have taken various measures, declared various economic relief packages to help the poorest section of the community, which includes farmers, migrant laborers, and workers of informal sectors and others. People who are just above the poverty employed in gig economy are also the ones who have been slipping down into the poverty, mm. poverty pool. <laughs> Health ministries in both the center and the state, they have undertaken micro plan for containing local transmission of the disease as well as developing our health infrastructure. All these factors together is having uh, are having deeper impact on our economy and society our market economy our consumer uh, society all are going to be affected uh, badly i will not elongate my lecture it is better to learn from the economists and from the person with expertise in commerce and management before I hand it over to our honorable speakers, I once again would like to uh, uh, express my gratitude to Professor Shantari Rai Mukherjee, uh, Professor Dr. Shoibal Kaur, and Dr. Pranam Dhar for sparing some of their valuable times for us. At the same time, I definitely uh, like to thank Dr. Shonali Mukherjee whose enterprise has made this event possible. I'd like to thank Pritam Dhara, the very young colleague of mine, who has operated a lot in organizing this event. My seminar committee or webinar committee organizing secretary, convener, Sri Pradipta Mukherjee, IQC coordinator, Dr. Rupa Shen, Barstow Dr. Lu, uh, Lipika Molli, along with all the other teachers and uh, my non-teaching colleague, deserve lots of thanks and applause for their tireless job. So <clears throat> with all these notes of gratitude and thanks, I'd like to start the session with our honorable speakers. Uh, uh, over to Shujata. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Pradipta Mukherjee, Mr. Pradipta Mukherjee, are you here? Yes. Hello, Pradipta Mukherjee? Yes, Madam. Hello? Yes, Madam. Am I audible? Yes. yes yeah, madam. you are audible. Uh, yes, Mr. Pradipta Mukherjee? He's responding. He's here. Pradipta? Yes, madam. Yeah, can you ah. hear? Ah. Yes, madam. Oh. Be a bit louder. Use your earphone, please. Okay, okay. So, oh. Dr. please give the introduction of. Yes, before I introduce uh, uh, our distinguished speaker, Professor Sanchari Ram Mukherjee, may I request Pritam Dhara to, uh, to deliver the, uh, to give the uh, guiding principles for the webinar uh, to be followed by the participants. Pritam, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. That was indeed a very nice presentation. And I would like to welcome all our respected delegates for guiding us to the enriched field of knowledge. Before starting the webinar, I would like to give some few instructions. All the respected participants are instructed to kindly switch off their mute button of the logged in device and also their video. 
and i would request all our respected speakers to kindly limit their presentation within 25 minutes and 5 minutes will be open for queries thank you thank you over to you pradeep sir yes it is a uh, really proud privilege for me to introduce professor sonchari roy mukherji having a great academic background academic contribution to the nation she has also been a fundamental source of uh, inspiration for the administrative uh, group uh, she is the dean faculty of council uh, faculty council of pg studies in arts commerce and law north bengal university along with this uh, she uh, is having uh, eight Uh, phd students as of now and already supervised eight phd students she has supervised six mphil students and supervising one mphil student and uh, 52 number of publications already being published well uh, she ha- is a exchange visitor to france under the program franco indian government of france what at the mention the sciences dilemma the foundation recone and also selected for a visitorship under the foreign scholar research grant program of the university de uh, valladolid spain between february and march 2000 she is the visiting uh, she received the visiting fellowship to the international center for research on women washington dc usa ford foundation by to work on labor market market and women's right between october to december 2002 uh, she is ex- uh, received the exchange visitorship to france under the program franco indian again in 2006 uh, received bilateral research collaboration program under iccsr esrc visited development studies department university of east anglia uk for 3 months and other than this she is a uh, invited guest lecturer by professor jose rick clichman at the university of uh, valdolid spain she is also the invited guest lecturer at the university of east anglia participated at uh, as regional expert at the workshop on policy advocacy for enhancing equity and rights in the management of common property resources in the hindu kush himalaya the railways in the colonial communication system of india a reappraisal paper presented in uh, in indian history congress university of mysore invited as panelist in several panel discussion uh, visited cumin uh, china visited as and delivered special lectures in various uh, universities like uh, national defense academy stockholm uh, presented same many papers uh, in india and outside india too now uh, she is the member of pg board of studies since 1988 member of board of research studies in economics in 1999 member of standing committee of the center for women studies university of north bengal a uh, member board of undergraduate studies since 2003 regional coordinator east 2 ugc scheme of capacity building of women managers in higher education since 2005 ugc observer net examination in uh, select east and north east examination centers since 2009 ugc nominee to governing bodies of uh, narendrapur ramkrishna mission ashrama kolkata uh she is also uh, the head of department of economics north bengal uh, during 2005 to 2007 and 2011 to 2013 and the director of center for women studies north bengal university april 2005 uh, to 2009 february uh, many uh, uh, papers have been published uh, books have been uh, uh, published by her but it is her human that touches upon us she is always the source of inf- ins- uh, inspirations for many women speakers too and she fights for women uh, workers along with migrant workers too with this short introduction may i request professor sonchari roy mukherji to deliver her speech madam
thank you, Dr. Pritham. The introduction was anything but short. Anyway, uh, a very good afternoon to all my listeners and attendees. I'm really thankful to the principal of Hiralal Mojundar Memorial College for Women, Kolkata, who have invited me to this webinar um, on impact of COVID-19 on the economy, Indian economy. I'm also thankful to my esteemed colleagues from the Department of Economics and, um, and Commerce and, uh, uh, and, and, and the IQAC coordinator, Dr. Rupa Shin. And, uh, excuse me, just, and, uh, and the other esteemed members of the organizing committee. Now, I extend my heartiest greetings to my co-presenters and co-speakers, Professor Shoibal Kaur of, um, from ICSSR and CSSS, and Dr. Pranam Dhar from West Bengal State University. I also express my gratitude to the Honorable Vice Chancellor of the West Bengal State University for supporting this event. Now, all these virtual seminars or the webinars that are being held, it is indeed quite a novel, ex novel experience for us academics. And since it has brought all the interested on the same platform and across all geographical boundaries. Um, at the outset, I would like to mention that as economists, we tend to use facts and figures to validate our arguments. And I will be approaching in the same manner. However, while participating in other webinars as a speaker and also as a participant, I've realized that it is very difficult to follow the figures or slides on the virtual platform and react to it. Thus, I will try to use only a few gross statistics. Again, since I'm the first speaker of today's webinar, I'm taking the opportunity to provide an overview of the present economic situation, and finally end with few policy suggestions to overcome the crisis. Uh, India, as we know, is located in South Asia and is the seventh largest country in the whole world by area, and the second most populous country behind only China. Now, presently, India's population has grown to 1.33 billion. For a country to grow, first of all, the utilization of its existing resources in the most efficient manner is a necessity. And so is the distribution of resources to ensure distributive justice for all. Now, at the same time, for development to occur, it is imperative that the human resources or its citizens are provided with health and education by the state which may be considered as entitlements of the citizens following Omicoshen. Now, beyond this, for a country to achieve economic stability, it is important that it can sustain price stability, sustain a low unemployment rate, create increasing income opportunities, income earning on opportunities, and a favorable balance of trade. Now, these are the basic features of a developing economy, which we have all studied and which we are all aware of. Now, besides this, of course, with demographic transition, it is observed that the services sector become primary to job providers, followed by industrial sector, where, where we find the manufacturing and the engineering to assume more importance than the others. And finally, we have the agricultural sector. Now, in India, between 2008 and 2018, the sectoral share of these major sectors to the gross domestic product where 49% for the services sector, 27% for the industries, and 57, uh, sorry, 15% from agriculture. Now, agriculture engages around 45 to 50% of the labor force of the population, but it contributes the lowest because it does not produce high value commodities. Thus, India has been experiencing a shrinking of the agricultural sector and expansion of the industry and services as is expected from a developing economy. Further, the Indian economy had been subject to considerable growth uh, since liberalization in the early 1990s. And India's GDP growth rate has consistently been well above 5% for the last 10 years. 
As a result of this growth, the country's GDP was ranked the sixth largest in the world in 2017. Additionally, unemployment had also been controlled and had fallen to 3.5% in 2017. And as per the World Bank figures, it is 25 in 2019. Now, part of the reason for India's economic success is the economic liberalization that started in 1991 and encouraged trade, subsequently ending some public monopolies. GDP growth has slowed in recent years due, to, uh, due in part to skyrocketing inflation. And India's workforce is expanding in the industry and services sector, growing partially because of international outsourcing, a profitable venture for the Indian economy. The agriculture sector in India is still a global power, producing more wheat or tea than anyone in the world except for China. However, with the mechanization of a lot of processes and the rapidly growing population, India's unemployment rate remains relatively high. Now, given this very sketchy background, let us turn to 2020. COVID-19 in all its ugliness have impacted all walks of life, bringing life itself to a standstill. The global economy is in shambles and very judicious steps, in fact, a very judicious measure of, of fiscal and financial and monetary measures need to be taken for the world to make a turnaround. turnaround. And India is no exception. Now, if GDP is considered to be a good indicator of where the country is heading to, then India's quarterly GDP was estimated to a decline of over 9%, nine, minus 9.3 to be precise, between April and June 2020. Now, this was a decrease from a 5% growth in the beginning of 2020. The country went into lockdown on March 25th, 2020, the largest in the world, restricting 1.3 billion people at home. And this was extended to end of May, and a partial upliftment of the lockdown happened in June. Now, the virus has been found to have infected indiscriminately, but it was found to have different effects on different groups, communities, ethnicities, ethnicities but the stark divide has emerged with regard to gender. Now, besides the impact on health, the pandemic has a severe impact on long-term economic prospects, which I intend to highlight. Now, while I'm not going to dwell upon the global issues, I would like to mention that the impact of the coronavirus had not only brought the global economy to a standstill, but had set the clock backwards on the development progress of several nations. Now, while the rate of infection in India was, did not appear to be as high as many other countries, but the precautionary measures adopted to have dealt a severe blow to the country's major industries with finance, real estate, and professional services bearing the largest brunt at an estimated loss of 17%. Now, having said this, let us now see what are the aspects in our working lives that have been affected by the pandemic under lockdown and post-lockdown. Coronavirus is a contagious disease, and without any vaccine or any assured medication, we are to maintain social distancing and keep ourselves safe by following certain rules and, and go for isolation or quarantine. Um, out of fear of endanger endangering others. Our mobility has been highly restricted and we are living a life of uncertainty and fear. Now, in this context, the first question that leaps to our mind is, which are the economic center sectors that will be most affected by the pandemic and ensuing lockdown and while maintaining virtually no contact with another individual? Now, while we salute the frontliners like the doctors, nurses, the sanitation workers, the health workers like the ASHA workers, we must concede that without their active presence and braving the odds of getting infected, life will cease to exist. Now, let us glance, take a glance at some statistics. First, a very interesting statistic. 
First, the statistics of the various activities involved during lockdown. Activities which we would uh, not have otherwise undertaken. And for sure, these activities, the activities which we used to undertake before the onslaught of the virus, have undergone a distinct change. Now, this is based on an online omnibus survey undertaken in mid-April by Statista in 2020. The results of the survey show, show a spike in the involvement of household chores as a result of the coronavirus lockdown across India. Other popular activities like including watching movies and TV shows online and uh, social media exchanges and um, you know online games, online courses, all these seem to have also spiked. Now, along with this, I would like to also mention that there has been a huge digi digi sorry, digitalization in the, uh, which is taking place in our own lives. Now, like digital payments for groceries and medicines in retail stores in India, as of April 2020, accounted for 35% of the surveyed population as shown by Statista. And from our own lives, we can also make that out. And statistics show that the consumer market that is least affected by the pandemic and the lockdown is the telecom. Again, household income in India was drastically impacted due to, due to the coronavirus lockdown. And as of April 12, 2020, there was a significant decrease in the level of income with households, reporting a fall in income from about 2% in late February to a whooping 45.7% in mid-April. Rise in income also saw a contrasting spread, indicating similar results from say 31% in late February, 10.6% on April 12, 2020. According to the statistic, uh, Statista survey, which uh, collaboratively with Rakuten Insight, on panic buying after the coronavirus outbreak, 81% of the Indian respondents started stated that they felt safe after stockpiling on items. In the same survey, the majority of respondents who engaged in panic buying stocked up on dry food, dry food items, personal hygiene health, hygiene products, and medical supplies. Now, due to the measures introduced to curb the spread of coronavirus in India, residential mobility saw a decrease in June compared to April 2020. The biggest industry in India is retail, which makes up almost a quarter of the nation's GDP. Retail and recreation had the steepest decline at 67% in June compared to the baseline periods in January and February. With easing of restrictions since the end of May, workplaces saw an increase in mobility that month, although still a declining trend was visible compared to the baseline periods. Now, looking at our immediate environments, while every member of the family was confined at home during lockdown, each member, depending on their age, gender, and work involvement, expended their time according to their own needs and requirements. For example, a woman's care work, including household chores, had risen many fold, restricting her own time and space. Thus, this unpaid work, unless shared by other members, takes a toll on their personal health and also on their efficiency while having to work from home. In the absence of domestic helps, which actually 80% of them being women, around 80% being women, who are also on lockdown, confined at home. Women of the household are overburdened with caregiving and simultaneously, many women have lost their jobs as domestic helps, even in post lockdown, since the apprehension of getting infected in a family with children and elderly has eliminated the possibility of retaining them in the service in the long run. The a significant number of women who used to work as domestic helps belonging to the informal sector are now out of unemployment. Are out of employment. 
The primary reason why I gave this example is because all of us actually go through this, are going through this. Now, it is widely discussed, has been gravely affected in terms of the listening. Now, informal activities are distinct from formal ones. Researchers opine that informal sector provides a temporary safety net to the poor during economic crisis, where crises are often referred to like recession, war, war situations, natural calamities, resulting in an economic crisis. However, a calamity or a crisis of this proportion, that is a fallout of the COVID-19, caught our economy unprepared. In fact, all the economies unprepared to deal with the sectors that are low valued and employ low human capital. And the fact remains that poverty is the result of low, low levels human capital, which reached a staggering heights during the pandemic. Another sector which is in very hard hit is the construction sector, the real estate. In fact, the largest organized market by value in India is construction. However, a large number of men and women are employed as construction workers in the formal sector. With construction operations coming to a halt, the backward linkages which is created by the sector, namely the suppliers of raw materials and their workers, have suffered an insurmountable loss. Thus, coronavirus has dealt a severe blow to certain major industries that constitute the country's lifetime. The loss incurred by enforcing a lockdown in the country was estimated at 26 billion US dollars, and a significant decline in GDP growth is also expected in the June quarter of 2020. Now, with the imposition of on transportation worldwide, the trade sector also took a hit. The exports and imports saw a drastic decline in the country, especially in the case of essential commodities such as petroleum, food crops, and coal and others. Now let us take a look uh, on the effect of the, uh, at the effect on businesses in India. The supply chain has been severely disrupted with the lockdown. Of us are accepting that. Many startups, small and business enterprises in India, were expected to face issues of supply disruption and decrease in demand. Now, the effects of aid from the government was until April arguably deemed inadequate in the face of the faltering economy. Again, experts opine that the growth rate of the automotive business in India was expected to be the most adversely affected, followed by the power supply and IT sectors, probably because of the industrial shutdown during the lockdown. More recently, India has developed, now in case of the IT sectors, the blow is still stronger because India has developed a reputation as a breeding ground for IT specialists, and the relatively low wage levels make India a very popular a decision for outsourcing. The IT industry in India is continuing to surge with over 143 billion US dollars worth of revenue generated in 2016 and 17, contributing a considerable amount to the country's overall GDP. And with the deleterious impact of COVID-19 lockdown industry, the economy is bound to stagger. Agriculture also remains a very key industry with in India producing exportables like rice, wheat, cotton, and tea. Mining industry is also one of the major contributors to the economy of India. The country is one of the largest producers of iron ore, the fifth largest producer of bauxite, and the third largest producer of coal in the world. But in the absence of mining, in the absence of the industry or the factories operated, obviously these sectors are going to be very, very hard hit. Now, as mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, the estimated cost of full lockdown has been 26 billion US dollars. And the value of government aid to combat COVID-19 in India is 348 billion Indian rupees, 
to combat the effects of coronavirus lockdown as of May 6, 2020. The largest value under the package went towards payments to farmers, as mentioned by the organizers, under the PM Kisan scheme and women account holders of the Pradhan Mantri Jan Dhan Jojana. The relief package also falls under the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yojana scheme with a commitment of about 1.7 trillion rupees as reap for this time. However, if you look at this, a large segment of the population still now lie outside this ambit who need support. Thus, the coronavirus COVID-19 had been at the center of the loss of lives and livelihoods on a massive scale. In India, the economy alongside the population also requires nursing back to health. Let us look back a little. The lockdown came at a time when the economy was already staggering. Trade across sectors was estimated to be impacted. This directly affected the procurement of essential items, including testing equipment. Besides the import and export business, yet another major revenue generator that received a blow the tourism industry. India's predominantly unorganized retail market was yet another casualty with the lockdown, increasing the pressure on the online retail segment to rise to the occasion. Now, companies offering digital payment services such as Paytm, Google Pay, etc., appear to have benefit from this. However, the pandemic brought out the worst of our public health care system. While the impact on the economy was one thing, lives were at risk, putting health care at the forefront. Access to, access to proper health care services was a major concern within India, irrespective of the pandemic. As of 2018, public health expenditure was valued at nearly 1.6 trillion Indian rupees. Now, since government health facilities were the more affordable option for a majority of the population with the spread of the virus, it put tremendous pressure on the existing healthcare services. Thus, it is a lesson to learn that public or social expenditure should be given primacy over others to combat the pandemic as such. While the growth rate is in the negative, as I've mentioned earlier, in the first in the present quarter, let us see which sectors have registered the least growth. As mentioned earlier, the financial real, uh, real estate and the professional services experienced a growth of minus 17.3%, mining and quarrying, minus 0.7%, electricity, gas, water supply, and other utility services, 13.9%, Construction, 13.3%. All these are in the negative. Trade, hotels, transport, communication, and broadcasting services, minus 9.7%. So these are the sectors which have been very strongly hit. While whatever has been mentioned is based on sectoral impact of COVID-19, some of the figures will portray, portray the gradual death of the economy. Let us now observe the dislocations in employment owing to the invisible end. If you look at the distribution of the workforce across economic sectors from 2009 to 2019, we find that around 43% of the workforce in India were employed in agriculture, while the other half was almost evenly distributed among the two other sectors, industry and services. While the share of Indians working in agriculture is declined, it is still the main sector of employment. And it is the, but it is the services sector that generates most, most of the country's GDP. That is 49%, which I mentioned in 2019. In fact, when looking at GDP distribution across economic sectors, agriculture lags behind with a mere 15% contribution. And some of the leading services industries like telecommunications, software, textiles, chemicals, and production only seems to 
increase have increased over time till 2009 the gdp in india was also growing and so was employment unemployment which had reached 2.55% in 2019 according to world bank figures it registered an increase by 24% in may 2020 there was a fall in income to the tune of 43% mentioned earlier and the rise in income was also arrested from 31% to 10% now a word regarding the retail food and beverage sales growth growth in health and hygiene products is expected to register a rise in sales e-commerce is also on the rise however the other retail businesses will be hard hit because of avoidance of visiting the stores and predominance of health issues in our life our spending behavior is also changing global online traffic has increased by leaps and bounds the various apps have registered huge demand this include grocery delivery apps and online grocery orders in fact surveys have shown dependence on local retail which increased by 41% the survey based by on uh, um, survey by statista the 8514 respondents in may 2020 shopping malls are experiencing in significant number of footfalls and very soon retail business in such supermarkets and malls will experience a severe setback in spite of the unlocked up those who are employed here be laid off cut down the costs the business houses which who can operate which can operate with least contact will ensure fewer people people on their office premises while curtailing of office work the work from home will now be the new norm however while trying to recover the losses the companies or the business houses are sure to downsize the laying of offer of workers or cutting their salaries drastically which workers in several sectors are not trying to grapple with there will also be revenue losses in the sports industry that includes the industry producing sports gear the various leagues the 2020 olympics all been postponed causing a monetary and impetus loss by the industry one can go on talking about the various industries that have suffered losses during the pandemic the monetary aid and the aid in kind announced recently by the government although bring some relief it is surely not adequate enough the problem currently is not so much with the supply chain but with the demand lack of purchasing power coupled with rise in the unemployed will cause the demand to shrink once there is lowered effective demand production is expected to fall in the next few months with fall in wages lower employment opportunity and that's following the nobel laureate obj binay tanji's words one needs to have money in hand to boost the demand which is one submit way to revive the retail and other businesses it has already been mentioned in several forum that increased state support can reverse the present situation manrega or popularly known as the 100 days work needs to be enforced to bring more number of men and women into the force and a possible increase in the number of days to surely have a positive impact on rural income the center for monitoring in the economic cmi provide the disturbing figures that in may itself first crore 20 lakh workforce has been rendered jobless where majority were daily wage workers and small enterprises the ceo of the cmi uh, has mentioned that of the 12 crore jobless 9 crore 10 lakh are those workers who will have to worry about what to eat the next day if they do not have any work thus one can imagine the plight of these people who are being reduced to just foods there will be several uh, severe pressure on the rural economy with the reverse migration taking place in an unprecedented manner causing deaths and accidents which are rather shocking the migrant workers who have returned to their origin had taken a big leap 
walking hundreds of miles in distress and often, often succumbing to their fate, returning to their villages to practically nothing on offer. No remittances, no jobs, no savings to fall back upon. These families are in deep poverty and the brunt of the economic pressure is largely borne by the women of the household. The pandemic in its, all its ugliness has exposed the economic insecurity of the majority of the people in India and the rest of South Asia. A recent issue which has been a cause of concern is the issue of the rise in fuel prices. While it is generating revenue for the government, it will have a cost cascading impact on the economy, causing prices to rise even for the essential commodities. Although the PDS system has been advised to, be, to, to overhaul and revamp to provide food grains to the helpless, and the helpless, but it is time that the targeted PDS should be replaced by general PDS to ensure food for all. The recent assurance given to 80 crore people of food grains is possibly a step towards this end. Privatization of several poor sectors may not be desirable and the outcome may have to be achieved at the cost of sovereign security and self-reliance. But it is too early to comment on these issues. As a final word, it is essential to ameliorate the economic distress that both men and women are subject to, supporting livelihoods and families in distress. COVID-19 will have a long-term impact on the economy, on the society, community, livelihoods, and on both the genders affecting gender relations. Lack of gender responsive pandemic control policies will put women at the risk of being neglected yet again. Deepening of poverty will bring out the evils in the society and will find inequalities of all sorts. Now on an optimistic note, India hopefully will adopt policies that will ensure the retention of the workforce by providing support to businesses to recover the law, besides what had been provided to the NFM. People need to be fed before they can think of other things. And that assurance that is basic for survival is of utmost urgency, along with assurance of getting proper and adequate healthcare services during the pandemic. Policy responses by government must be grounded in human, women, and labor rights. Cash grants and cash transfers may provide support to uphold the right. Uphold the right to adequate standard of living for these for those who have lost their income as a result of COVID-19 including those who are unable to, to earn their livelihoods before they <laughs> doing the policy. On a happy note, let us just wait for the government to react and the global react globally and win the domestic front so that at least the workforce are back in work, back to work, mm -hmm. and that the livelihoods many will be safe. Thank you, dear listeners, for giving me a patient hearing. Thank you, thank you, Shansaridi. I take this privilege to thank you, especially because uh, the, uh, despite your uh, severe ill health, you you just uh, uh, you, you are just present over here. Thank you. Over to Shonali, madam. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Shansaridi, madam. Your uh, expression was so beautiful, so nice, and there are so many messages in chat box. Thank you, madam. Uh, Chandra Bodhi? Chandra Bodhi? Yes, Shonaridi. Uh, please give the introduction, next speaker. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I feel immensely privileged to introduce Professor Dr. Shoiban Kaur today. Professor Kaur is currently Professor of Economics at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta, and he is also a Research Fellow of the Institute of Labor Economics, Bonn. 
He has been a professor of economics, Calcutta University, and a research fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation during 2008 and 9. He held visiting positions at Amsterdam School of Economics, Santa Fe Institute, HWWI, United Nations University Wider, Edith Coven University, and University of East Anglia in recent years. He is the managing editor, South Asian Journal of Macroeconomics and Public Finance. He also serves as the honorary director of the Eastern Regional Center of Indian Council of Social Science Research or ICSSR. To mention a few more facts about his academic career, his research interests are broadly in the areas of labor economics, international economics, and development economy, having published in well-known peer-reviewed journals such as World Development, Environmental and Resource Economics, Resource and Energy Economics, The World Economy, Politics and Economics, etc. His books entitled The Outsiders, Economic Reform and Informal Labor in a Developing Economy has been published by Oxford University Press in 2011. He has also published another <coughs> book on trade and development in 2014 from the Oxford University Press and another book from Springer, New Delhi entitled Industry and Labor Market Issues in Developing and Transition Countries. Recently, a jointly edited volume, International Trade, Welfare, and the Theory of General Equilibrium, has been published by Cambridge University Press in 2018. Professor Kaur has undertaken research projects funded by CEDES, outside WTO, ENRECA, GDN, Government of India, Planning Commission, UNICEF, etc. We are indeed delighted to welcome you to our webinar, sir. And with this brief introduction of an eminent speaker with such excellent academic acumen and expertise, may I please request Professor Dr. Shoibal Kaur to touch, start his session now. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I'm audible now to all of you. Um, yes, sir. OK, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. And also thanks to uh, your principal, Professor Shoma Ghosh and um, Professor Shonali Mukherjee for organizing this thing and inviting me as part of these proceedings. Um, also, my my artist congratulations to uh, to all the speakers who have made it, uh, despite all the all the uh, odds that that weigh against us at this point. Uh, so um, it, it's a good opportunity to talk about certain things. And as my co-panelists, um, it's good to see it's good to see uh, Shoncharidi again, and hope she's doing fine. Um, and and it, it was a good and nice roundup about what is happening with COVID in general uh, for India, as well as for the uh, you know um, the the prospects that lay ahead of us. Whether we can call it a prospect or not depends on the current situations and how we can really manage it better than we have done so far. Are, are questionable things, are debatable issues that are that should be left open to a larger audience from time to time. And the reason I, um, you know, I, I choose to speak to some of these webinars is that it's also about creating certain uh, value additions to the academics as well as to the to the general perceptions about what crisis or a certain stoppage to the regular life, whether it's an economic life, it's a social life, it's a political life, uh, can bring to the whole humanity and, and how we can take ourselves out of it to create conditions which would allow us to get back to the normalcy uh, as soon as some of the you know, uh, more, more um, suitable or more, more um, you know, con 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 uh, convenient conditions of uh, existence emerge with um, Either the either the vaccine or with some other kinds of um, <clears throat> you know um, approach that pe people have been following for 100 years or more because this has this is not first time that uh, the, the people in the world has been suffering from uh, a contagion related crisis. This time it's also about the physical contagion and the contagion of a virus leading to disease. But the economic contagion, the contagion of crisis, has been much more common. 
in, in even in recent times i mean there there has been 2008 crisis there has been 91 crisis there's been 87 crisis 83 crisis and of course Sean Chaudhary mentioned the 1930 crisis professor shomakos also also mentioned the uh, the the um, you know the the uh, the degree to which the, or the extent to which this crisis can be compared to the last big crisis of the 1930s or the big or the great depression so what i will do quickly uh, because i really do don't do not wish to take too much time but my entire approach would be about talking about certain issues which are somewhat neglected in the statistical and economic or commercial dealing of the crisis related to COVID, <clears throat> whether it can be initiated and instrumented for a country like India would be one part of it. The second part would be also to show uh, in line with what Sean Chariti has been saying, that what has been the, the standard of losses, but with a focus on the labor market aspect alone, because I essentially work on labor economics, mostly theory. I'm not an empiricist, so I don't deal with current data uh, even, even in during this time where data is absolutely um, not available for a country like India, you do get some data for the Western countries because there's a continuous way of collecting data, processing it and providing it for public usage and public consumption at a much faster and a much wider rate compared to what the developing countries have been able to do so far. So the evidence and the learning experience is still very West dependent or very so-called, as we call in uh, the, the, the jargon of economics, the north-south divide, the, the divide is still in favor of the north because the things that they have done, the policies they have taken, uh, it's not successful for many cases because people are essentially um, anti-institutional like we are, uh, that we don't really care about the government mandates, we really do not care about what the, uh, what, what the what the subject experts or even the medical professionals have been telling us time and again to uh, to, to to create for ourselves the the cocoon that we should have been li lived living within but of course there are certain restrictions there are certain uh, impediments to the conditions of living in developing countries including the large number of cases of the migrant workers you have seen who could not uh, have been living in a very serene atmosphere in a very um, sanctimonious atmosphere to say to say in the list so that uh, the spread and the containment could have been much more effective than it has been but let me just show you a presentation where the three things that i'm going to talk about are actually detailed out i'm not going to share the presentation with you at the end of the session but there are direct references in the presentation to the actual papers from which i somewhat some somewhat borrow and and uh, and kind of um, reinstitute or or, or redesign uh, some of the points to make it a point to to make it uh, appropriate for the context that we are going to talk about today. So I'll just take it to the presentation mode and I'll read some of the things from there. I'll show you a couple of graphs on which you'd also see how people are uh, exposed to different contagion. Uh, particularly of the disease related contagion, what are the kind of professions, what are the countries that are more exposed to this contagious behavior among the people, and how we can really think of possible ways of getting out of it, particularly with reference to the labor in India. Okay, so please hang on uh, a few seconds and let me get onto the presentation mode. Okay, so that's the presentation. If you can see, it's a PDF file, and that's a title. On the top, you do see that there are two pictures, one on the left side, on the left side of the screen, by which I mean uh, the, the, the one blue wall uh, in front of which the worker, uh, a worker possibly from a factory is going out, completely dejected, possibly not having a job. And on the right side, the smaller picture, which shows a whole legion of workers and you can tell from the kind of uh, representations we have seen in different newspapers in different media uh, formats that these are the migrant workers probably trying to go back to some place to their to, to the places they have come from that their points of origin so these are two pictures which 
somewhat summarize and highlight the situation that we are going through. It's not a rosy situation. It's not a situation which would, which would take us, uh, you know, uh, in a spirit of going back to work immediately becoming more productive, it would actually make us think a little more about what possible ways we could have made before such crisis happen. And we do have time. It's not a one-off thing because like I said in the beginning, crises keep on happening from time to time. It's like a business cycle, so to say. But the only difference is that business cycles are not so much a matter of life and death. In some cases, they are. I'm, I'm, I'm just retracting one bit from the uh, expression that I've made. Business cycle can be really problematic for certain businesses where it can go out of practice or go out of uh, go out of context, become uh, un unusually uh, succumbing to a certain business cycle from time to time. But rarely, though, business cycles are not so much a matter of life and death as this COVID-19 crisis has created for the policymakers to face a painful trade off between saving lives and saving the economy. So it's a it's a dilemma which doesn't have a quick answer. And all of us trying to go through this kind of webinars, trying to understand by discussing time and again, the possibilities that open up with uh, either lockdowns and slowing down of uh, or slowing down of economic activities and then lifting of the lockdowns. These are all prospects of keeping ourselves in some way uh, from, uh, from the harm's way as also for living the economy to some degree of um, exposure to problems that we have to get rid of as soon as this um, this crisis slows down and this crisis is over with but essentially to assess the economic damage that households uh, can you see the presentation does anybody should answer yes sir clearly visible sir you okay fine thank you, on, sir. thank you okay so to assess thank the you. economic thank damage that households attribute to the virus a recent survey was conducted in the united states like I said, we learn a bit from the north because the surveys are much more prominent and potent in, in such places, not only because of resources, but also because of uh, an, an institution prevailing, which has not been played around by the um, governmental interventions from time to time, like we see for India, uh, very roughly, roughly put it, but that's, that's typically the case. Regardless, so what we see is regarding the perceived financial situation of the survey participants and possible losses due to the coronavirus, both in income and wealth. What did it do? Well, it measured households' concerns about the financial situation on a 10-point Likert scale with higher levels indicating that there are more reasons to be concerned. So 10 means I'm extremely concerned. One means I'm not so concerned at all. So this would be naturally, you can, you can clearly tell from here that there'd be certain professions who would not be really concerned by this. I mean, look at the, um, look at the, look at the, uh, the new industries, look at the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the Western, the, the West coast of United States where this entire uh, you know, Silicon Valley is actually booming with more work than it was before the crisis because all of us have moved into some kind of platform which they are the providers of, right? So there are certain professions, certain businesses which would show a larger concern than some other business. That's easy to understand. But can we measure it? That's a much more difficult point because you need service. You need to go and talk to businesses, to people, to managers, and to, to, to different sections of the uh, labor force in order to assess the exact impact of this, what this can actually lead to. That, so therefore the mean, uh, sorry, the average and the median response was seven and eight respectively, right? Which meant that most households are highly concerned about their personal financial situation. And it was also found that large declines have happened with their income and wealth. Basically, 42% of employed respondents reported having lost earnings due to the virus with an average loss of being loss of about five thousand dollars right that's a lot of money even by the u.s standards because the, the average average american is not as as rich as bill gates or um you know mr tesla mr telsa so so this this has to be have some impact on the economy on the short run as well as the medium and long run as uh, sean Chedi was also talking about more than 50 percent of such households with significant financial wealth report having lost wealth due to virus and the average wealth lost is about $33,000. OK, 
okay do we exactly have do we have an exact replica or an estimate for indian consumers indian producers indian households my answer is no if you can find something like this which would which can which can tell us on a press of a button that what has been the loss of the household level i would be the first consumer of it but i i don't think that exists and we need more of it in order to assess whether the whether the whether the subsidies whether the support if they are adequate if they are targeted and if they are actually productive for the indian and uh, similar other developing country scenarios we probably do not have <clears throat> such facilities yet presented to um, the population of such countries so given the important role of wealth effects on consumption the drop in wealth as i have shown in the previous point can put further downward pressure on future consumption again these are easy to understand but these are also important points to note down <clears throat> so what are the economic costs of lockdown i'll take an example from an ex exclusive experiment done in the united states again and it actually took a comparison between counties and us also have counties i mean those those who think of counties like a like a typical english version or a british isles thing but it's no i mean us has all the counties in different in different states so there was a control and 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 treatment group of counties taken up by a set of researchers so those counties which were, which came under lockdown and united states did not go under lockdown on a full scale basis it's still not under full lockdown which is why you see such a such a raving you know uh, growth of coronavirus and government is probably sitting quite idly about it but this is the separate issues the treatment and uh, treatment and control counties led to certain findings what are those findings the study instrumented lockdown with a dummy variable which is to say put equal to 1 when there's a covid crisis or, or at least one case what did it use it studies the labor market response to local lockdowns individuals living in counties currently under lockdown are 2.8 percentage points less likely to be employed that's that's the lower side of the estimate i would think the estimate is much higher because even in united states uh, close to close to 50 60 million individuals applied for labor market support and they do have the support that if you some for some reason go out of jobs not because of a you know fault of yours because the company closes down or you lose out to external forces like a like a oil price shock or, or 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 a natural disaster or something like that you qualify for certain kinds of unemployment insurance then turning into unemployment benefit which can run for one year up to two years and even more depending on the kind of contract that you have gone into with the employer and the government being the tripartite agreement that uh, that most of the workers actually go into and 60 million workers have actually logged in and submitted their applications for this kind of support which means that the percentage shown here are on the lower side of the estimates typically because there are certain assumptions made in the paper and the reason i'm telling you this that if there are some students of economics here they might think that well there's a there's an issue in economics which we popularly call and and people who are not from economics don't worry about it but this is just about a common sensical understanding of how relationships work it's something we call in economics an identification problem an identification problem means that whether y affects x or x affects y that's an identification one has to understand before running into some kind of relationship check right if you do not understand the identification properly then most of the regressions and we see tons of the, those in 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 the regular uh, you know journals and people who are not so accustomed with doing uh, you know uh, advanced research they make this mistake of trying to understand the causal relationship between variables and and factors and run into different kinds of problems this paper also ran into a problem by assuming that most of the households will not have their behavior change due to lockdown now we know we have seen lockdowns in kolkata we have seen lockdowns in different cities of the country and we know that the local behavior has to change to some extent it's not going to be a permanent change of course you're not going to change change your your consumption habit your work habit your 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 jogging habit or whatever habit you have completely or permanently but it definitely has an impact on the short and medium 
run. And therefore, uh, the assumption about this behavioral relationship between households not being affected by the containment is, I think, erroneous, which gives a somewhat biased towards the lower side estimates about what amount of labor might get affected by this. I hope I'm being, I'm, I'm being able to uh, explain back to you exactly the points that I've mentioned here. It's sometimes difficult because I can't see you, you can't see me clearly, and therefore, uh, you know, communication becomes somewhat um, jolted because of this uh, lack of lack of physical proximity, which is, uh, which is actually what we're trying to avoid. Uh, in any case, the degree of variation introduced by lockdown is large. For example, these results imply that lockdowns account for close to 60% of the decline in the employment to population ratio. And there are both supply and demand sides. And we are also having other webinars sometimes back. Uh, Professor Mochuj Khotam joined us from London School of Economics and he, he, he raised a good point also uh, in one of the seminars. He said that this is a point where if you think of a graph uh, and then put uh, demand and supply somehow together with the price and quantity on the on the on the vertical and the horizontal axis just for the like like first year uh, first day uh, microeconomics then you would know that we are actually working towards the zero zero point of the coordinates uh, where both demand and supply are at the lowest possible limits i mean that's a that's a bear that we are living with the bare amount of demand the bare amount of supply which is what the current situation has pushed us towards. And this is the reason why both supply and demand has come down towards the zero zero point on the axis, because the first order supply shock has come from the labor supply shock due to, Im due to inability of the workers to work from home in non-essential industries, right? So, I mean, we can teach from home. Uh, I was discussing this with Sean Charity this morning. It's fine, we can, we can talk from home, we can have webinars and all kinds of things, but it's also kind of, you know, pressing on your um, attention, it's pressing on your ability to, to come and uh, to speak. Uh, you know, we go out there, make a presentation, it's, it's a performance which we are completely missing. And we are also, um, it's, it's, it's creating a problem for a, a loss of skill in some cases. So people are not being able to produce as much as they could. Supply gets affected by that. What else? Labor supply shocks due to mortality and morbidity. I'm not saying that millions are dying, but still, you know, the, the kind of fear that Corona has spread into people are restricting people from giving their all, right? On the other side, if you look at the right side of the, of the box, the first order demand shock comes from the fact that increase in the demand for healthcare services and related industries have gone up. That's a plus, right? Whereas most of the other non-essential commodities are not being demanded right now. Those are those are strict negatives. A minus comes with those. These are part of a paper, like I told you. I can give you examples and uh, the, the sources. This is a paper by uh, Gonzalez Xavier Estupinen. He he's with uh, in, in the labor organization posted in Delhi. They have come out with a paper. It's in SSRN, freely available. You can look up and find the paper and download it if you wish to read more about this. Nevertheless, what it suggests is that procedure-wise, in order to analyze the degree to which disruptions in labor markets translate into changes in aggregate demand, we should study the spending pattern of of survey participants using survey answers on how much rupee, on how much dollar is being spent on narrowly defined categories during the lockdown. And this is an example. I'm not going into the details of it. You can see some of the, some of the headings here. There's a date payment. You have to pay, pay your EMIs no matter what. I mean, EMIs for India, it has been um, put on a hold. Um, which would probably come with a higher interest when you when you actually go back and start presenting it, start uh, you know uh, paying it back. Um, sorry. I did something. It says you're presenting, but I can't see my presentation. Okay, let me let me stop and then you are I'll go back here. Okay, our window. Right, so we are back. What else? Utilities, food, clothing, gasoline, medical. 
gasoline, medical, travel, recreation, entertainment, these have taken big hits, right? Education, childcare, furniture, jewelry, all put on hold. I mean, once this gets over, we'll go back and start buying this again if we are still left with enough money and enough wealth to do that. So this kind of survey actually helps you understand what sectors are affected most and what kind of what kind of subsidies and support might the government be doling out to people who are the worst hit among the crisis. Who among those in the workplace are most exposed? This is a category that Mr. Lewandowski, who's a, with um, United Nations University in uh, wider, um, has actually worked on something like this with European data. And they show that the exposure to disease or infection, physical proximity at work, dealing with client, pupil, or patients. So teachers are not exempt. Uh, working in public spaces, working at the client's premises, not working from home. These are all reasons how people might get affected, might get contaminated, and therefore all hell would break loose once uh, the contamination happens. And there's a, there's a matrix which, which you can actually look up. Uh, again, these are from a paper, not my own creation. I'm just, I'm just trying to make a point here that these are the things that all the developing countries should also practice much more seriously or at least conceive of in, in sometimes in the near future so that uh, later, later crisis can give us way out much faster than we have been doing this time. So what else? Well, in order to study the relationship between countries' occupational exposure to contagion and the spread of COVID-19, they define a two country level variable. Country level average exposure to contagion right, it's based on the ETCCs and the share of workers, according to the value of ETCCs, which is above the European median, and th what they do is draw a line. So I'll show you the line first. So this is a line of no contamination, the zero line. If you do follow my cursor here, the straight line is the line of no contamination, okay? Anybody to the right of it runs the risk of getting contaminated, Any anybody to the left of it, do not run the risk of contamination as much. So you can clearly tell from here that people who are health professionals are to the far right. Okay, so these are the healthcare and uh, doc uh, medical professionals, right? Teaching professionals are on the margin because we do have exposure to students, to other other visitors from rest of the world. You know, a place like Center for Studies gets visitors from all over the world every week for seminars and conferences. So I mean, it, it's a good thing we closed down right right at the time of the uh, crisis started spreading because this would be more um, you know would take the teaching professionals at least from for people like us to the right because our exposures are also high. So this goes on you know depending on what kind of people you are talking about, what kind of professions you are talking about. There's a whole bunch of professions which are noted down, listed, and therefore taken as a serious note can be used by the government to understand that who can be made to do work from home and who must come, right? And what, what's happening right now is pretty arbitrary. I mean, we are getting recommendations, we are getting ideas, we are getting thoughts uh, from the governments, loosely speaking, and we are trying to make the best out of it without knowing whether this is the right kind of response to the problem that we are facing. So there are there are efficiency losses because of the responses not being of the right magnitude and direction. I hope I'm making a point clear. Similarly, at the country level, you could see that some of the countries have much bigger exposure. So United Kingdom, the very last entry here has been largely exposed, right? So has been Switzerland, Spain, Sweden. And Sweden chose to get exposed because it's a small country. They thought uh, the community or the herd immunity uh, H-E-R-D, herd immunity, would actually lead to uh, eradication of the problem because then they would it, it would spread among everybody. If everybody is contaminated and not at the serious level, then we can all go out and have a cup of coffee together. I mean, that's that's a motto. Didn't, didn't work very well in the beginning, but probably is working much better as most of the European countries have been able to bring down the effect of contamination to a, to a steady, to a, what, what I would call a steady state of a low degree or of a low magnitude. Uh, but this goes on and on. So raising the lockdown would have its impact also. I hope you have heard about Richard Laird. He's a well-known professor from uh, Oxford and he has worked on something like 
you know, the economics of happiness and many other things. And they, they come out with some possibility of, of what are going to be the positive and negative effects of lockdown uh, or withdrawing the lockdown. So what are the positive effects? Well, increase people's income now and in the future. No doubt about that. People have running jobs. If they're if they're out of jobs, they don't don't have income. Nobody's going to keep you keep paying your salary like like uh, we are fortunate in getting. But most of the people in the in the so-called uh, semi-regular, semi-contractual, informal sector, largely speaking, unorganized sector, uh, as a, as a as a um, as a subset of it, are not so fortunate in that matter so it, it it does you know going out help improves your mental health uh lowers down suicide domestic violence addiction loneliness all of these things are gone maintains confidence in the government restores schooling as time progresses the positive effects will increase in magnitude what are the negative or the or the um fallouts well increase the final number of deaths from the virus so it's a it's a casualty check that keeps us home. I mean, just because we do not have sufficient medical facility to support us when we go out and get contaminated, lockdown was the answer to it, right? So lockdown is not the solution. It was only a way to, uh, to stop the overflow of medical professionals being uh, swamped by cases of coronavirus that cannot, that doesn't have cure. Uh, what else increases road deaths? Commuting, CO2 emission, air pollution, and all of the kinds of negative externalities associated with our day-to-day -day life comes back if the lockdown is lifted, but lockdown has to be lifted. So it's not about corner solution, but it's only about, you know, if you remember your um, utility functions and indifference curves, it's about being on the indifference curve, choosing the levels of the positive and the negative at the same time. So these are the benefits, and I'm not going into the details of this this well-being metric that was created by Richard Laird and Richard Laird and others, but this is also about the index of the inputs that I talked about. They put them in and sh and show that there are certain timelines uh, during which you should lift the lockdown. If you had lifted the lockdown in May, this applies to um, this applies to uh, UK. This applies to UK, but it could it could again be done for in India for other Bangladesh or for the developing countries and see what are the prospects of lifting the lockdown on a certain certain date. So if it were lifted on May 1st, loss would have been minus 27. Some metric doesn't, doesn't have to be a number exactly, some estimate. On June 1st, only one, July, July 1st, 33, August 1st, 63. So longer the lockdown, the positive effects are probably going to be more, right? So. Uh, it's a choice that's still open. I'm going to finish. Is informal sector in India um, critical for spreading the uh, effects? You can see that this is the informal sector employment. Uh, a lot of people know about that. Uh, Shugoto Marjit and I have worked extensively on informal sector arrangements and issues, uh, particularly with uh, emphasis on India and other developing countries. So you can you can have looks uh, look it up. But the whole point is, uh, let me just talk about one or two points and then I finish. So I've tried to summarize several aspects of the COVID-19 on the labor market and about the macroeconomic impacts. So regarding South Asia, particularly India, focus should be much more on employment relations at the industrial level. And I propose strongly that in order to save the day for India, as well as some of the other industries, which are other service sectors, which the government is actually undermining for a long time now, like the insurance sector, could be entrusted in, in bringing back the Indian I labor market and the industry. Internet. Please do not talk. I mean, cut, cut down your uh, sounds here. Sorry. So, uh, so it is just about the insurance base, which could save the day by creating certain kinds of unemployment insurance and other other facilities to the workers it would not be costly governments could easily chip in a small amount which would be much lower than the rescue packages that are announced from time to time is it difficult to monitor well no national sample survey has a strong monetary base monitoring base for different workers in the country it could be just another another element in their estimates from time to time that they work out at the state level every every couple of months so it's definitely a possibility. Government is not taking it seriously. Government should think about it. The parliament should make a mandate about putting the uh, healthcare and other insurance as a mandate, 
as a mandate for the people of this country so that recurrence of crisis might save workers from similar uh, similar disparate situations in future i hope i've made some points here thank you thank you for being patient so i close down the uh, presentation now thank you thank you sir uh, it was so uh, so very informative session sir so excellent session thank you sir uh, uh, dr mukherjee let me take the privilege uh, of thanking dr shoibal kaur because despite his very busy schedule he has agreed to spare some of his val valuable times for us thank you on behalf of the entire team of hiralal mazumdar college for women sir and now it is time thank you so much i appreciate thank you sir now it is uh, time to welcome our host come guest dr pranam dhar pradeep to yes madam ah uh, pradeep to yes. please madam can you hear me can you hear me me yes sir your audio is audible oh. sir please continue sir yes sir yes sir well i deem it a honor and privilege to introduce uh, uh, the man in need in i am saying this in context of of uh, uh, in true sense of the term that man in need uh, dr pronam dhor he is uh, always a uh, teacher a student friendly teacher a colleague friendly teacher and uh, a man always uh, is there for need now in, uh, before i introduce him i want to uh, share my thoughts uh, some thoughts that uh, whenever we feel uh, feel that uh, something has to be done in regard to nss in regard to uh, environment in regard to management studies that we uh, a, a name always come in our mind that is dr pronam dhor well uh, he completed his master degree in commerce from university of calcutta with first class and stood second in 1995 along with his qualification professional qualification from ikwai he achieved gdca in 1997 from la mer institute of information technology he also achieved a diploma in junior bookkeeping and accountancy from the board of commercial education west bengal he completed his phd degree from the department of business management university of calcutta in february 2008 dr dhor has a full time teaching experience nearly 20 years before joining the university uh, uh, called west bengal state university he ha has served the department of commerce of vivekananda college kolkata as the head of department besides he has taught as a guest teacher or as a visiting faculty member counselor for almost 21 years di uh, in different eminent colleges of kolkata and in the post graduate department of commerce <coughs> with farm management in bidyasagar university west bengal he has also served as a guest faculty member in mba department of iisw bm kolkata in the bba mba and bca departments of institute of management study kolkata and also as a guest lecturer and counselor in the mcom and msw departments of ignu different study centers kolkata and nsou howra chapter he has uh, authored more than 20 books and also 120 research articles published in different regional national and international journal he takes a lot of interest in information technology apart from his first area that is finance well he has supervised uh, more than more than uh, 25 mphil uh, dissertations and nine uh, completed phd students of different and also he is associated with uh, calcutta university vmu singhania university manav bharti university jharkhand rai university bharti darshan university shastri sai university varthiar university and west bengal university of technology well most of uh, whom are college and school teachers who ha uh, he has guided he has also 
adjudicated 45 more than 45 phd theses and worked as a research person in more than 30 research methodology workshops and symposia he has also edited uh, two journals named info.com and bodhi artham published by the department of commerce vivekananda college kolkata he has also completed three ugc sponsored minor research project till date and also completed one major research project sponsored by the indian council of social science research icssr he has also attended different national and international conferences on accounting finance and information technology both as resource person as well as a participant he has also participated in different workshops on research methodology organized by the different universities and institutes all over india and abroad as resource person he has also developed two websites of two research organizations like www.iaarf.org.in and www.caacu.org.in he has received best faculty award and distinguished faculty award in 2016 he has also received best social scientist award and indo global excellence award in 2017 received delit uh in management from commonwealth vocational university in december 2017 at world management from common uh, world management congress kolkata december 27 17 sorry received distinguished teacher award from international multidisciplinary research foundation in january 2018 received delit in banking and finance from international economic university in february 2018 and also received ibrf educational excellence award 2018 for excellence in area of banking finance at krasht university pune he is the associate professor and head department of commerce and management west bengal state university along with this he is the chairman post graduate board uh, in commerce and management chairman undergraduate board in commerce chairman undergraduate board in music honors chairman undergraduate board in defense studies honors chairman undergraduate board in physical education convena postgraduate departmental committee commerce and management uh, convena board of research uh, studies department of commerce and management and the program coordinator nss wbsu he is the member of sports board wbsu state president west bengal and all india vice president indian academic research association and he is the adjunct professor in institute of management study kolkata advisor public service commission government of west bengal an external member ug and pg research board of studies brainwar university uh, you can reach him through his uh, website that is www.pronamthor.com uh, with this uh, brief introduction may i uh, call dr pronam thor to deliver his uh, uh, deliver his lecture sir thank you so much uh, sir but uh, i think the introduction was bit lengthy uh, thank you so much uh, professor uh, shoma ghosh honorable principal hiral majumdar memorial college for women kolkata and i extend my heartfelt thanks and gratitude am i audible am yes, i audible sir. yes sir yes sir yes okay. sir uh, i also extend my heartfelt gratitude to professor sanchari roy mukherjee honorable dean Uh, of economics uh, and uh, commerce of north bengal university honorable vice chancellor of north bengal university is very much well known to me and also respected professor shoibal kor uh, honorable director erc icssr uh, and uh, i take the privilege uh, to uh, have the uh, occasion to act as panelist uh, and uh, to express my own view i respect the professors very much a full professor is a dream for me although i uh, my selection committee was over in 2015 still awaiting uh, the professor post uh, for the reason unknown to me uh, but still it's a dream for me i also extend my heartfelt gratitude to every uh, participant present here and i think uh, the uh, participation and feedback was a Uh, criteria for this webinar i don't know all the people are leaving should i continue from 140 it has reached to 114 i think feedback should have been distributed a bit uh, later 
So, uh, could my share? Sir, uh, one, I, I, I'd like to share something. It's my experience. It's, yes, ma'am. It's important. Uh, participation is important when you are able to comprehend. So, the people who are here, they will uh, have their comprehension about your lecture. So, please carry on. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and now I am sharing. Uh, Is my screen visible? Not yet, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Visible. visible. It is visible, sir. It is visible, sir. Yes, okay. now it is visible. Sir. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Thank uh, you so much. Uh, so, uh, uh, already lots of things shared by Professor Roy Mukherjee and Professor Kaur, and I, I think myself to be a very novice uh, amongst them, but still uh, sharing my views. Uh, some of things have already been told, so I am not repeating them. But uh, my topic of uh, discussion today is the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in India. So the, I am starting with the backdrop. The COVID-19 pandemic is, in India is a part of the worldwide pandemic of coronavirus disease 2019 caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome, that is SARS-CoV-2. And the first case of COVID-19 in India, which originated from China, was reported on 30th January 2020. As of 30th July, 3rd July 2020, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has confirmed a total of uh, 6,25,544 cases, 3,79,891 recoveries, uh, including one migration and 18,213 deaths in the country. India currently has the largest number of confirmed cases in Asia and has the fourth highest number of confirmed cases in the world. Uh, with the number of total confirmed cases uh, breaching the 1 lakh mark on 19th May and 2 lakh on 30th, 3rd June. India's case fatality rate is relatively lower, that is at 2.80% against the global uh, percentage of 6.13% as of 30th, 3rd June. The data is of 3rd June only. Uh, six cities account for uh, around half of the all reported cases in the country, that is Mumbai, Delhi, Anuradhapur, Chennai, Pune, and Kolkata. As of uh, 24th May 2020, Lakshadweep is the only region which has not reported a case. On 10th June, India's recoveries exceeded active cases for the first time, reducing 49% of the total infections. Now, in this scenario, before discussing the economic impact, which is the today's, today's agenda, let me have some literature review. Because lots of people, lots of research and researchers all over the world are uh, researching not only on the microbiological or the virology, virological part, but also they are researching on the economic impact and the recovery part. And uh, to discuss among uh, a few of them, let's start with the Daniel Lewis, uh, Carlyle, uh, Carl Martins, and James Stock. And their title of the paper was U.S. Economic Activity During the early weeks of the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak. The source is mentioned here, COVID Economic 6, 17th April 2020. And they, uh, this paper was a descriptive study. And uh, they constructed a weekly economic index and uh, developed to track the rapid economic developments associated with the response to the novel coronavirus in the United States. And their conclusion was that in normal times, familiar microeconomic, macroeconomic aggregates uh, provide accurate uh, descriptions of economic conditions with a modest delay when conditions evolve rapidly from day to day and week to week as in the case of a uh, case in the current economic current environment less familiar sources of data can provide an informative and timely signal of the state of the economy the wei that is the index provides a, a parsimonious uh, summary of that signal uh, to mention the others like the papers of uh, andrew glower uh, it has also uh, try to create uh, some uh, epidemiological standard epidemiological model by inputting certain heterogeneity factors like age and multiple sources of disease transmission and they have incorporated uh, the epidemiological block into a multi-sector economic model in which workers differ by sector as well as by health status and their uh, conclusion is also given i am not detailing out the third paper was uh, by R. Maria and others, and it was on the supply and demand shocks in the COVID-19 pandemic and industry and occupation perspective. And they have also 
use some model. The model is mentioned here, shown here. This is the model. And this paper has sought uh, to provide uh, quantitative predictions for the US economy of the supply and demand shocks associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. So these are the only some literature reviews. Lots of, lots of researchers are uh, researching everywhere in the world, not only on the microbiological, not the health, health sector, but also the economic impact, what should be the uh, COVID and post-COVID economic impact and how to recover from the same. Uh, already outlined by Professor Sanchari Roy Mukherjee and Professor Shoibal Kaur, and uh, uh, some you know, things are also already mentioned, especially in the liberal economics by Professor Kaur. Now, uh, before coming to the crisis of India, let's discuss some global crisis. And this is a truly global crisis, and no country is spared. Countries reliant on uh, tourism, travel, hospitality, and entertainment for their growth are experiencing particularly large disruptions. Emerging market and developing economies face additional challenges with unprecedented reversals in capital flows as global, global uh, risk appetite wanes and currency pressures uh, while coping with weaker health systems and more limited fiscal space to provide support. Moreover, several economies endured these crises in a vulnerable state with sluggish growth and high debt levels. For the first time since the global depression, both advanced economies and emerged markets and developing economics, developing economies are in recession. For this year, growth in advanced economies is projected at six minus six point one percent. Emerging market and develop, developing economies with normal growth levels well above advanced economies are also projected to have negative growth rates of minus one percent in 2020 and minus two point two percent if you exclude China. Income per capita is projected to shrink for over 170 countries. Both advanced economies and emerging market and developing economies are expected to partially recover in 2021. Now, this is the scenario you see uh, the global, uh, we are comparing the global financial crisis in 2009 and global uh, lockdown in 2020. It is, to, uh, it is very clear from this graph that during the global lockdown 2020, the GDP growth rate has come down to minus six, which was only uh, up to minus four during the global financial crisis in 2009. And the uh, country wise, I have taken here five countries. Uh, this uh, study shows this is a study done by um, uh, Cape Gemini, and they have taken the five, uh, five countries and the country's pictures, even the US at the uh, lowest bottom, so uh, which was the uh, highest blooming economy now at the shifted at the lowest level. So these are the latest world economic outlook growth projections uh, monitored by um, IMF uh, world economic out outlook. And you see the projected growth of even the United States is project projected at minus 5.9. And uh, in 2000 in 2020 end and in 2021 uh, it will be at 4.7. Whereas India is moving certain upward uh, rising country and uh, the projected growth is projected at 1.2 although uh, this was a uh, figure of april 2020 and now it's much much better off we are at 3.6 or 3.7 somehow so worldwide post pandemic economic impact let's discuss it assuming the pandemic threats in the second half of 2020 and that policy actions taken around the world are effective in preventing widespread farm bankruptcies, extended job losses and system-wide financial strains. We project global growth in 2021 to rebound to 5.8%. This recovery in 2021 is only partial as the level of economic activity is projected to remain below the level we had projected for 2021 before the virus hit. The cumulative loss to global GDP over 2020 and 2021 from the pandemic crisis could be around nine trillion dollars, greater than economies of Japan and Germany uh, and Germany combined. Now coming to Indian crisis, it has to be mentioned here that Indian lockdown is the largest in size because you have to measure the lockdown not in terms of days only, but in terms of also population size. So in terms of both number of days and both number of population size, India had the highest lockdown. And when we are discussing the economic impact of COVID-19, we have to take into consideration also both the uh, health uh, aspect and also the lockdown decision aspect for the uh, for combined economic impact discussion. 
now uh, india has started it uh, lockdown on 21st 22nd march 2020 and uh, it has tried to unlock and this is the unlock two phase going on and as india moves towards lifting its lockdown and resuming uh, normal operations it is this vulnerable population that needs protection nonetheless it is easier said than done understanding the existence and condition of the defined vulnerable group across states would be the first step to creating effective post lockdown strategies additionally the added intersectionalities of economic and social poverty attached to the elderly and chronologically ill population would make it hard for states to have a uniform path to addressing the needs of the vulnerable population now this great lockdown has caused so many losses uh, like uh, you see the world economy has experienced and will experience the worst recession since the great depression due to this lockdown and uh, concerning the indian economy the economic impact of 2020 coronavirus pandemic in india has been largely disruptive india's growth in the fourth quarter of the fiscal year 2020 went down to 3.1% according to the ministry of statistics the chief economic advisor to the government of india said that this drop is mainly due to the coronavirus pandemic effect on the indian economy notable notably india had also been witnessing a pre pandemic slowdown and according to the world bank the current pandemic has magnified pre existing risks to india's economic outlook as per world ratings the world bank and rating agencies had initially uh, revised india's growth for financial year 2021 with the lowest figures india has seen in three decades since india's economic liberalization in the 1990s however after the announcement of the economic package in mid may india's gdp estimates were downgraded even more to negative figures signaling a deep recession the ratings of over 30 countries have been downgraded during this period on 26 may trisil announced this announced that this will perhaps be india's worst recession since independence state bank of india research estimates a contraction of over 40% of in the gdp in the first quarter of uh, 2021 the contraction will not be uniform rather it will differ according to various parameters such as state and sector now uh, you see the great output loss due to uh this pandemic which amounts to uh 68 lakh sorry 687 lakh uh, 688 lakh crores in indian rupees and uh, 9 trillion us dollars due to this pandemic and i am going now sector wise although professor roy mukherjee and professor kaur has discussed this i have some highlight on these sectors now first coming to post pandemic unemployment unemployment rose from 6.7% on 15th march to 26% on 19th april and then back down to pre lockdown levels by mid june during the lockdown an estimated 14 crore people lost employment while salaries were cut for many others more than 45% of the household across the nation have reported an income drop as compared to the previous year the indian economy was expected to lose over uh, 32000 crore inr Uh, every day during the first 21 days of complete lockdown which was declared following the coronavirus outbreak now the situation has improved a little and now uh, lots of companies have shut down major companies in india such as larsen and tubro uh, bharat forge uh, ultratech cement grassim industries aditya birla group vel and tata motors have temporarily suspended or significantly reduced operations young startups have been impacted as funding has fallen first moving consumer goods companies in the country have significantly reduced operations and are focusing on the essentials only stock markets in india posted their worst losses in history on 23rd march 2020 however on 25th march one day after a complete 21 day lockdown was announced by the prime minister sensex and nifty posted their biggest gains in 11 years coming to transportation sector all india motor transport congress that is aimtc secretary general navin gupta said that the accumulated losses to tra- truckers during the first 15 days of lockdown were about rupees 35200 crore given an average of rupees 2200 loss to per truck per day 
more than 90% of the about 1 crore trucks in the country are off roads during the lockdown as truckers with only essential commodities are on the move, he said. And coming to the real estate sector, National Real Estate Development Council, a body of realtors, puts the loss in the sector at rupees uh, 1 lakh crore. I am scared to estimate what the losses would be. I think a potential loss of maybe rupees 1 lakh crore on a conservative basis, on an all India basis. It is a conservative figure. I cannot think of the upper end figure, he said. Coming to the real trade sector, the Confederation of All India Traders estimates that the losses incurred by the retail trade of the country in the second half of March due to COVID-19 pandemic were a massive 30 billion US dollars. Coming to the electricity consumption, with factories closed and power demand coming mostly from households, peak demand has plunged the average demand during peak evening hours that is 7 p.m. contracted by 26.6% uh, for April 1 to 10, 2020 over the last year, according to daily reports published by the Power System Operation Corporation Limited. Uh, all the things are given in the slides and already it has been handed over to the authorities. You will get in, the, in due course, of course, with their permission. Now coming to the consumption of petroleum products. With fewer vehicles uh, plying on roads, consumption of petrol fell by 16.4 percent in March 2020 over a year ago according to the data from the petroleum planning and analysis cell. Diesel consumed in factories and for plying commercial vehicles saw a sharper hit as consumption fell by 24.2 percent year on year in March 2020. Anal analysts believe that fuel demand may remain weak even after the lockdown is lifted as citizens may avoid travel for some time. Now, uh, purchasers manage, purchasing managers indices PMI. It has also been extended, expand, uh, expanded expanded uh, uh, barely in expansion zone. The two PMI indices uh, complied by IHS Market India showed slightly diverging trends. The services business activity index fell to 49.3 in March and down from February's 85 month high of 57.5. The manufacturing activity index saw a more modest fall to 51.8 in March from 54.5 in February. This is because non-government services were the first to be hit even after a complete lockdown was announced. Now coming to cargo at major ports. Cargo handled by Indian ports fell the most in five months, dragged down uh, by a drop in the liquid cargo and container volumes. Ports across the country handled 618.7 lakh tons of cargo in March, a decline of 5% over the year ago period, according to data compiled by Bloomberg Quint. Other major sectors impacted already discussed by Professor Mukherjee and Professor Kaur, so not going to the details of them, but arrival of agricultural commodities. Lots of losses of food grains were made uh, not only by pandemic, but also I have to mention very uh, indicative thing, especially in West Bengal and Odisha, Amphan. It has caused lots of food grain, loss, food grain losses and unorganized sector suffered a lot and the people from un unorganized sector remain really unemployed till now. Manrega suffers a lot of loss, restaurants, tourism and hospitality sector still suffering a loss, food grains uh, export and food and fruit export to mention in our West Bengal, mangoes and other fruits which were very much exported uh, these days, during these days, have suffered a lot, not only by pandemic, but also by Ampan. MSME sector having large losses, electronics, pharmaceutical and consumer durable suffered a lot, online business sector and FMCG, FMCG sector were also suffering a lot. Sub, uh, coming to supply chains and logistic, logistics. Following the lockdown, short and essential supply chains broke down. Britannia Industries, supporting the lockdown, urged the government to ensure interstate movement of the raw material for the food processing industry were not hampered. The managing director of Britannia stated that even if even one link in the supply chain is broken, the country could run out of stocks of packaged food in the next seven to ten days. 
coming to the salaries the prime minister on 19th march urged businesses and high income segments of society to take care of the economic needs of all those who provide them services during the live telecast he also appealed to families to not cut the pay of domestic help following the lockdown the government circulated advisories and directive uh, ordering companies uh, to keep paying employees among other things but in spite of lots of issues lots of advisories and more memorandum issued on 23 march 2020 lots of salaries were cut lots of uh, people were fired and they became unemployed now migrant workers and labor force this is the most important thing to be discussed here due to lockdown daily wage workers especially the urban poor and the migrant laborers were left with no work at the same time the lockdown restrictions put a stop on the movement of buses and trains large number of migrant workers ended up walking back to their villages soon after a central government directive in late march state government set up 21000 camps to house over 6 lakh 60000 migrants and stop the exodus over 500 hunger relief centers were set up by the delhi government by the last week of march by 5th april uh, 75 lakh people were being provided food across the country in food camps and we must mention the effort of west bengal government in this regard which has done a lot in taking back its migrated workers and their uh, rehabilitation and camping and necessary uh, 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 the necessary medication measures has been a landmark in the whole uh, arena of india now coming to the very intricate issues that is recovery measures taken by government of india please give me 5 uh, minutes more uh, measures taken by government of india to combat first of all the government of india announced a variety of measures to tackle the situation from food security and extra food for health care and for the states to sector related incentives and tax deadline extensions on 26 march a number of economic relief measures for the poor were announced totaling uh, 170000 crores the next day the rbi also announced a number of measures which would make available rupees 2 lakh 374000 crore to the country's financial system the world bank and the asian development bank approved support to india to tackle the corona virus pandemic now in the different lockdown phases uh, india issued different circulars the different phases of india's lockdown up to the first unlock on 1st june had varying degrees of the opening of the economy on 17th april the rbi governor announced Uh, more measures to counter the economic impact of the pandemic including 50000 crore inr uh, special finance to nabard cdb and nhb national housing board on 18th april to protect indian companies during the pandemic the government changed india's foreign direct investment policy the department of military affairs put on hold all capital acquisitions for the beginning of the financial year the chief of defense staff has announced that india should minimize uh, costly defense imports and give a chance to domestic production also making sure not to misrepresent operational requirements now on 12th may prime minister announced an overall economic package worth rupees 20 lakh crore uh, 10% of india's gdp uh, with emphasis on india as a self reliant nation during the next 5 years the finance minister announced the details of the economic package two days later the cabinet cleared a number of proposals in the economic package including a free food grains package uh, then globally in a poll by the um, edelman trust barometer out of the 13200 plus people polled 67% agreed that the government's highest priority should be saving as many lives as possible even if, if it means the economy will recover more slowly that is life should come before livelihood for india the poll showed a ratio of 64% to 36% where 64% of the people agreed that saving as many as lives as possible was a priority and 36% agreed that saving jobs and restarting the economy was priority in india the life versus livelihood debate also played out where we see the confusing role of the central administrators uh, when prime minister modi announced for the, the first 21 days of india's lockdown on 24th march during this address to the nation he said jaan hai to jahan hai but his contention changed on 11th april and he said that uh, jaan hai to jahan hai but now it's jaan bhi hai jahan bhi on 14th april 
again it was changed uh, when it was extended uh, he has extended the lockdown decision and uh, in the prime minister's fifth meeting with the chief ministers on 11th may the prime minister said that indians must prepare for the post coronavirus pandemic world just as the world changed after the world wars during the meeting modi said jan se lekar jag tak that means globalization and thinking rethinking for the economy in the post pandemic period this was the vision on 12th may the prime minister addressed the nation saying that the coronavirus pandemic was an opportunity for india to increase self reliance he proposed the atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan now protectionism as on 18th april 2020 india changed its foreign direct investment policy to curb the opportunistic takeovers or acquisitions of indian companies due to the current pandemic and there was certain other alternatives had to be taken because china and other countries started created created creating problems the government of india is aiming to attract companies that wish to move out of china or are looking for an alternative to china the pm's office is conveying to the government central and state machinery to ready pro investment strategies a total of at least 461589 hectares has been earmarked for the purpose as reported by economic times now uh, uh, looking into the economic situation there were concerns as to where would the government find the funds to fund fight coronavirus and keep the economic alive uh, experts suggested measures such as looking into npa norms tax payments and income support to those in the unorganized sector a direct cash transfer scheme for the most vulnerable is also being considered as that happened in other countries on 8 april 2020 the managing director of bajaj auto uh, rajiv bajaj wrote in an opinion piece in the economic times that the lockdown makes india weak rather than stronger in combating the epidemic but there was a, a trade off between the health risk and the economic risk and to support this thing lots of uh, center and state collaboration discussions was there lots of fallacies were there lots of tassels were there but for economic recovery uh, lots of uh, packages uh, amounting to rupees 20 lakh crores were uh, discussed and ensured upon by the uh, central government and the state governments formulated and implemented some of them but there are still some lacuna but ultimately coming to the economic recovery which type of recovery are we moving on throughout the world as well as specifically for india we may quote that in the beginning of may uh, a former governor of ibi uh, d subbarao said that india could look forward to a v shaped recovery a v shaped recovery is the best outcome and arthur d little an international consulting firm has suggested that india will most probably see a w shaped recovery now mithli uh, visurna Uh, writes in the economic times that u shaped recovery is the most likely followed by the by an l shaped recovery that means the flattened curve trisil chief economist says that if things go well that if the virus is contained we can expect expect a v recovery otherwise it will end up as a u recovery so lots of debates are going on all over the world regarding regarding the economic recovery and the situation is so vulnerable that we still are confused and we have some grave concerns too first one is deteriorating central state relationships and its major impact on economic recovery secondly lack of proper initiation in rescuing the migrant workers in time lots of deaths were caused untimely deaths were caused and that was a negligence on the part of administrators thirdly several other transnational issues emerged during the same period including deteriorating indo china relationships and almost worse situation in borders then very poor inactions in timely decision making both in locking and unlocking these caused serious concern in economic as well as the social scenario moratoriums were too vague in nature sorry to say and far from reality lots of politicizations in major major economic policy decision making same like other issues like demonetization gst defense budget and expenditure and specially tendering and economic sanctioning and other allied issues and lastly the major concern nowadays is because it relates to our everyday life is delimiting oil prices and no carving on taxation policies of petroleum products and not uh, taking it into the uh, gst and other allied regulations so with these concerns 
leave it to you to think and rethink because you are the well judged the learned audience and concluding with the remark of uh, raghuram rajan that is the first step to prescribing the right medicine is to recognize the cause of the illness and when it comes to what is ailing the global economy extreme monetary easing has been more cause than cure the sooner we recognize it the stronger and more sustainable the global economic recovery will be the source is there and thank you all for your patient hearing and i extend my thanks to all the learned audience and also i extend my heartfelt gratitude to professor chomagos honorable principal of hiralal majumdar college for women and all other learned colleagues of that college and all other learned audience and especially professor sanchari roy mukherji and professor shoibal kor the two very respected co panelists for uh, giving me a link so that i could share my views and with this thank you all and uh, have a nice day and nice time stay well stay at home thank you so much thank you sir for such a nice session uh, madam madam hello madam yeah i am uh, am i audible yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, okay yes ma'am you are audible oh. uh i continue my heartfelt thanks to all the speakers for their lucid and composed presentation comprehensible for all including me who is not at all from this discipline this was a unique webinar where academicians and administrators combined their thoughts and uh and, and provoked us to rethink so administration and policy making join hands to enrich us unemployment poverty increasing gap between rich and poor are going to endanger our society and economy there is a possibility of erosion of social values increased risk of vulnerability of children and women crime and so many other things it is now up to the policy makers to take appropriate decisions to rejuvenate our economy and save our society however this thought provoking webinar will definitely help our future nation builders to think deeper with that i would like to request dr lipika molli to give formal vote of thanks hi madam আজকের ওয়েবিনার যেন শেষ হইয়াও হইল না শেষ অনেক কিছু জানাচ্ছিল তার কণামাত্র পেয়ে বাক্রুদ্ধ ও মুগ্ধ হলাম আমরা সকলে আর যে সকল বিদগ্ধ ব্যক্তিত্ব ছিলেন আমাদের সমৃদ্ধ করতে এইটুকু সময় তাদের জন্য অপ্রতুল এ যেন সমুদ্র মন্থন করে অমৃত প্রাপ্তি বা মুক্তর সন্ধান তবু সব শুরুত তো শেষ হয় মন না চাইলেও শেষ করতে হয় তারপর আসে আনুষ্ঠানিক ধন্যবাদ জ্ঞাপনের পালা আমরা আমাদের বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ের মাননীয় উপাচার্যের কাছে কৃতজ্ঞ উনি আমাদের শিখিয়েছেন কিভাবে উন্মুক্ত বাতাবরণে পঠন পাঠনকে অবাধ গতি দিতে পারা যায় স্বাধীন চিন্তা গড়ে তুলতে পারা যায় আমরা যে সমস্ত বিদগ্ধ ব্যক্তিত্বদের আমাদের সাথে পেয়েছিলাম আর প্রত্যাশা করি আবার আমরা সেই ভাবেই পাব যখনই দরকার হবে এখন ধন্যবাদ জ্ঞাপন করার জন্য দায়িত্ব পালন করতে চলেছি প্রথমেই উল্লেখ করব নর্থ বেঙ্গল ইউনিভার্সিটির ডিন প্রফেসর ডক্টর সঞ্চারী রায় মুখার্জির কথা যিনি তার অসামান্য বাগ্মিতায় আজকের ওয়েবিনারের সুর বেঁধেছেন এবং উপহার দিয়েছেন একরাশ জ্ঞান ভাণ্ডার তার অমূল্য সময় এবং জ্ঞান সমুদ্র থেকে কিছুটা আমাদের দেওয়ায় আমরা কৃতার্থ ডক্টর প্রফেসর শৈবাল কর মহাশয় তার আইসিএসএসআর ও অন্যান্য অনেক গুরুত্বপূর্ণ কাজ থাকা সত্ত্বেও আমাদের এই ওয়েবিনারে বক্তব্য রাখতে সম্মতি জানিয়ে আমাদের কৃতজ্ঞতা পাশে আবদ্ধ করেছেন তার অসামান্য জ্ঞানের পুঁজি থেকে যে কিঞ্চিত রত্নভাণ্ডারের সন্ধান আমরা করতে পেরেছি 
তা আমাদের চিন্তনে আলোড়ন সৃষ্টি করেছে আমাদের চিরকৃতজ্ঞতা পাশে তিনি আবদ্ধ করেছেন তার জ্ঞানের প্রবাহের দ্বারা ডক্টর প্রণাম ধর ওয়েস্ট বেঙ্গল স্টেট ইউনিভার্সিটির অ্যাসোসিয়েট প্রফেসর এবং এনএসএস এর প্রোগ্রাম কোয়ার্ডিনেটর হওয়ায় আমাদের অতি আপনজন তিনি সুবক্তা এবং জ্ঞান সমৃদ্ধ তার অতি ব্যস্ততা সত্ত্বেও তাকে আমরা পেয়েছি এবং তার অসাধারণ বাগ্মিতায় আমাদের চিন্তন ও মননকে অবগাহন করতে পেরেছি বলে আমরা তাকে বিশেষভাবে ধন্যবাদ জানাতে চাই আমি বিশেষভাবে ধন্যবাদ জানাই আমাদের অধ্যক্ষা ডক্টর সোমা ঘোষকে যার অনুপ্রেরণায় আমরা সমস্ত কাজ করি এবং মহাবিদ্যালয় বিভিন্ন ওয়েবিনার অনুষ্ঠিত হয়ে চলেছে তিনি সর্বদা আমাদের পাশে থাকেন এবং বিশেষভাবে উৎসাহ দেন তার মতো উদ্যমী শিক্ষককে পাশে পেয়েছি বলেই মহাবিদ্যালয় আজ বিভিন্নভাবে অগ্রগতি পাত্ত এবার আসি সংগঠকদের কাছে অর্থনীতি বিভাগের বিভাগীয় প্রধান ডক্টর সোনালী মুখার্জি এবং কমার্সের শিক্ষক প্রীতম ধারার উদ্যোগে এই ওয়েবিনার যার সংগঠনে ডক্টর মুখার্জি দীর্ঘ অভিজ্ঞতা ও জ্ঞান যে ওয়েবিনারটিকে বিশেষত্ব প্রদান করেছে তার বলার অপেক্ষা রাখে না অল্প কিছুদিনের মধ্যে সোনালীদি আমাদের অতি আপনজন হয়ে উঠেছেন তার ব্যবহারের মাধুর্যে আমরা ধন্যবাদ নয় আমাদের পরম প্রাপ্তি ব্যক্ত করি প্রীতমের তারণ্য ও ডক্টর মুখার্জির অভিজ্ঞতার সুরে যথার্থ ঝংকার এনেছে আমাদের ছোট সহকর্মীরা শ্রী প্রদীপ্ত মুখার্জি ডক্টর চন্দ্রাবলি দত্ত ডক্টর সুজাতা মুখার্জি ডক্টর প্রদীপ দাস এবং সর্বোপরি শ্রীমতী আত্রেয়ী ভট্টাচার্য ও শ্রীমতী পূজা দাস সেমিনার সাব কমিটির আহ্বায়ক শ্রী প্রদীপ্ত মুখার্জির সুযোগ্য নেতৃত্বে একের পর এক ওয়েবিনার সংগঠিত হয়েছে অত্যন্ত সাফল্যের সাথে যা প্রমাণ করে যে এই মহাবিদ্যালয়ে সকল শিক্ষক শিক্ষিকাই শিক্ষানুরাগী আইকিউএসি কোয়ার্ডিনেটর ডক্টর রূপা সেন যেভাবে যথাযোগ্য পথ নির্দেশ করে চলেছেন প্রতিনিয়ত তা ধন্যবাদের আনুষ্ঠানিকতার ঊর্ধ্বে অবস্থান করে পরিচালন সমিতির সমস্ত মেম্বারদের ধন্যবাদ জ্ঞাপন করি বিশেষত পরিচালন সমিতির সভাপতি শ্রী মদনমিত্র মহাশয়কে ধন্যবাদ দিই সমস্ত অংশগ্রহণকারীকে ধন্যবাদ জানাই অবশ্যই আমাদের শিক্ষা বন্ধু ও স্নেহের ছাত্রীদেরও ধন্যবাদ জ্ঞাপন করি ধন্যবাদ থ্যাংক ইউ লিপিকা আত্রেই 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 এবার তো বোধ হয়েটা শেষ হয়ে গেলে ন্যাশনাল সং পঞ্জাব সিন্ধ গুজরাত মরাঠা হিমাচল রমুনা গঙ্গা উচ্চল জল ধিত তব শুভ নামে জাগে তব শুভ আশিষ মাগে জন গণ মঙ্গল দায়ক জয় হে পারক ভাগ্য বিধাতা জয় হে জয় হে জয় হে জয় 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 হে ধন্যবাদ Thanks to all participants and please fill up the feedback form immediately. Thanks.
সোনালিদি সোনালিদি হ্যালো সোনালিদি হ্যালো সোনালিদি সোনালিদি আত্রি Thank you to organize though. 